SpaceX is collaborating with NASA on an integrated low Earth orbit architecture to provide a growing portfolio of technology with near-term Dragon evolution and concurrent Starship development. Now, this architecture includes Starship as a transportation and in-space low Earth orbit destination element supported by Super Heavy, that's the Starship, Dragon, and Starlink and constituent capabilities, including crew and cargo transportation, communications, and operational and ground support. So joining me today is Neil Thorne, and we're going to be talking about what this means from NASA and what SpaceX is capable of and how this is going to change space travel and space exploration forever and how this can eventually turn into a thing that SpaceX could use for their Mars transportation via Starship. But before we get into this conversation, let's take a moment and listen to a word from our sponsors. How are you doing today, Neil? I'm doing just great. How are you? I am doing fantastic. Thank you for asking. So the Starship going into low Earth orbit, and it seems like SpaceX and NASA are working together to use this as some sort of transportation hub or some sort of space station in the near term. And do you think that's what they're looking at here? No, it's a very vague sort of approach that NASA's taking there. They're not saying build us a space station. They're just saying, help us out in low Earth orbit. It's hard so. to say exactly what it is they're expecting out of this. I've thought for ever since the Starship became a thing that putting this huge object into space, this the Starship, which one Starship has more interior volume than the space station does right now. But you link three or four of those together and suddenly you've got quite a bit of space up there to for activities. Yeah, it'll be an interesting next few years for yeah. Starship and for NASA because eventually NASA will be the orbiting the International Space Station. What is it, 2030, I believe? 2030, 2032 or something? So, somewhere around there. It always seems to be a flexible number. Yeah, that's, it always seems like, I think they wanted to do it in 2026 at some point. Yeah. And then they. I think it's, as long as it's useful though, they're going to keep it going, but. Yeah, I think so too. I think as long as the taxpayers can pay for it and as long as the, they're seeing some returns from it. It's such an expensive thing to run every day to keep six people up there. It's just such an expense. And everything in there is so outdated at this point. The technology is advancing so fast here on Earth that even something they they started building six years ago that got sent up there two years ago is so far beyond the technology right now that it almost becomes irrelevant. Yeah, and SpaceX is working currently on their Starship program. And in the next, hopefully we can see this in the next, as Elon said, six to eight weeks, another launch of Starship. And when that happens, we'll see if it's actually going to be a possibility or feasibility that this will make it to orbit. And once it does make it to orbit, these studies that SpaceX and NASA will be working together on could become a thing. And they have to work together to get SpaceX's Starship onto the moon as well for Artemis 3. So maybe this could be part of that because they need to dock with the SpaceX Starship in order to get to the moon. So as you say, everything that... They need to do to help NASA here, they have to do for the moon as well. So it's going to be being built in sequence, I think, in parallel, I should say. Yeah, they're going to be using Super Heavy, which is the Starship program, a Dragon and Starlink. So the Dragon will more than likely be docking with it. And I think the Polaris program will be using a Dragon to dock with a Starship. I think what's going to happen is they're going to send a Starship to orbit. They're going to get it up there. Then they're going to send the crew of Polaris program in a a capsule, a Dragon capsule on a Falcon 9 and then dock with the Starship, kind of mimicking what they're going to be doing with the Starship and the Orion capsule. And then they're going to, they're going to go inside the Starship and do some testing and do some science and some experimenting, some engineering and see if it's actually feasible to live in one for a little bit and then Mm -hmm. do some more some more testing inside and maybe outside of the starship. So I think that's what they're thinking here. I'm not a hundred percent sure, but yeah, it's very vague. It really is very vague. This whole wording, I think they kept it that way. So I think so. So they can't be like yeah. starship is going to replace the international space station. Exactly. Know? And I think that would make 
a lot of companies very angry. The Blue Origins, the yeah, Axiom space, all these people would be very upset at that. And so I think you keep it vague. They're going to help us out. We're going to use their capabilities to, to further our goals. That's it. Yeah. And maybe that if, goal happens to be a new space station. Let it have to be a new space station. Yeah. Maybe eventually they will. Maybe eventually they will turn a international space station, turn it away, get rid of it. And then they'll put a couple starships together or even one starship. There's a hundred, or there's a thousand cubic meters estimated in interior volume of a starship, which if built right can hold for earth to earth transport, 100 people, according to Elon Musk. More than likely for these kind of missions, it'll be something similar to the International Space Station where it's about six people. Maybe the Starship could hold a little bit more because the space station has 915 cubic meters of internal space. And it's not that much different. It's 85 cubic meters of mm -hmm. difference. So you could put some more supplies in the Starship, but a little, yeah, it's not a, much it's though. The space in the space space station is more compartmentalized, so it's more usable space. Yeah, than the starship, which would be a more open plan, but obviously much probably much better for people's psyches as well. Yeah, I think so. Most of the renderings we've seen have has been a tube it through the middle with a ladder or some sort of transport in the middle, where you can go from section to section, but it's pretty wide open through the whole starship. And I think just people spend a year plus on the International Space Station and they're segmented off doing their experiments. Don't see anybody maybe all day. Maybe throughout the day, they might see one or two people. But if they, maybe there's seven, eight people in a starship, maybe you can see all the way through the starship while people are working. I think that'd be mm -hmm. really neat. I don't know if that's how it's going to actually happen. I think so happen. too. I think it would be a much more enjoyable atmosphere to even if you're not working with somebody that they happen to be across the nine meter gap between you working on something else and you can see them, I think that camaraderie gets built. And then again, people can also get on your nerves much faster. Well, <laughs> That's time. true. So yeah. obviously the, when they select an astronaut, they do a lot of psychological studies to make sure they're going to live and play well with others. So that will have to continue. Yeah. And sending a hundred people in Starship to any long distances is really difficult to conceive of. What are we talking about? 17, 16, 17 people per sort of starship, if you will. I can't imagine traveling a very long distance stuck in the same room, my, my sort of bedroom, if you will, the entire time. That would be very difficult because there wouldn't be much room for anything else. Yeah, that's true. There, so there, there's been talks of how many people could go on a Mars ship to from any, anywhere from six people to some people were saying 30 people and there were some people that were saying upwards of 100 people to mars i don't think it's going to be 100 people i think that's ridiculous i think that's way too many but i think if you have something like this where spacex and nasa are working together low earth orbit they can try different configurations for the long term uh mars transport because you could have two starships docked together what they're going to be yep. doing with the refueling of the tankers for the Artemis missions. Instead of a tanker, you have just a, another starship where people can float between the starships. There's a port and there could be a section where it's like a living section, where it's just you work out, you sleep. There's maybe some entertainment. There's big windows. And also there could be a variant where it's just cargo, where there's just a t like so much food and you're going to have to bring a lot of water to Mars or even to low Earth orbit. So sure, there's a possibility that's what they're going to be working on as well. And it's going to take, I wish it were to happen really fast, but space transport, space technology, engineering and science all take a long time. So what they're building now, maybe 50 years from now, we'll see the ultimate gain of we're going to be taking normal trips to Mars. Yeah. There's going to be just numerous trips per year to get to Mars. And I believe the next, the closest that Mars is going to be to Earth is going to be 2024. So maybe if Starship gets to orbit this year, and then maybe next year, who knows? Maybe they're going to start 
trying to get to Mars, just shoot a starship. <laughs> yeah, Mars. shoot a starship without any intention of landing it. Yeah, and just, uh, try, just try, try to get into Mars orbit or at least use the orbit to slow you down so that you could land if you wanted to. Yep. Obviously, that's the hardest part about any trip to Mars is making sure you hit the right spot so you don't burn up in the atmosphere or get slingshotted out into space, bounce off the atmosphere. So it's very difficult to do. And that's where the majority of sort of things being shot at Mars fail. So it's, they're going to have to practice that for sure. Yeah. Right the, now they're practicing getting the thing to orbit around Earth, which is comparatively way easier. So it's going to take some time and some, yeah, uh, who knows? Uh, who knows? We'll see what happens with the next Starship launch to see whether they actually get to orbit and there's no complications and we'll destroy the pad. And if that all goes to plan, then yeah, I could potentially see them trying to stretch themselves. Obviously, SpaceX is an iterative design company and they're not afraid to say, okay, we did it. Let's move on. Ship 15 was the first one to land. They didn't bother trying to land another one. They said, good, let's move on. <laughs> yeah. I could see them getting to orbit and saying, good, let's move on. I could see that too. Yeah. And saying, okay, we made the orbit. Now we need a tanker up there. Let's do that. Okay, now that's done. We don't need to do it a hundred times. Before they put people in the starship, they'll have to do it a hundred times. But if they're just doing tests, they're going to be happy with what they got and move on to the next challenge. Yeah, and even between the first launch and this next launch that's coming up, they switched. I think it. I think Elon said hundreds of things, maybe a thousand things, some, something like that, between the last Starship and the Super Heavy and the next one that's going up. And one of the most important things is that they're going to be doing hot staging between the booster and the ship, which is... Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sold on that just yet, but we'll see how it goes. <laughs> yeah, that seems like an incredible feat. I don't see that the, a lot of Russian spacecraft have done that in the past, and it seems to be pretty pretty well documented, but think SpaceX could pull it off. I don't know if it's going to work this time. It's the first trial and error. Exactly, it's right? This is all trial. This is all to be done, to be determined. They'll have to, they'll figure it out. It's not impossible to do. It's just a matter of figuring out how to make their current build sustain that sort of blast as, a, as they separate. Yeah. Obviously, they don't need some way to exhaust the flame as it comes out, but also the top, the dome, of the uh, the booster is going to have to withstand the all those engines lighting as well. Yeah, I don't understand how they're going to do it. I don't really understand that technology that much, but it seems like they have to reinforce, like it's a stainless steel dome mm. on this thing, so they have to and reinforce it with something. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's not a thick stainless steel either. Plus, they want to reuse these a hundred times. Yeah. So there really can't be any damage from this separation for this to be successful. There can't be any damage. It has to be 100% perfect. If it starts to wear away from the heat or there's any damage whatsoever, then it's unsuccessful. It's not going to be a long-term solution to, have to fix it. So do you think this could be something like a, for lack of a better term, a puck that they put on top of the booster and they could replace it if needed? So it's not going to be, it might not be 100% reusable right away, sure. but they could just use it just for that one time and then the next yeah. booster is going to have a different puck on it. And they could do something like the heat tiles yeah. that they've got on the outside of the ship. They could plaster those over the top of the booster and use those as an abrading replaceable part. Yeah, that. But it would take some time though. to re inspect those every time that it lands. Yeah, that's true. It's similar to the space shuttle. So, yeah, I think the I think we're going to see some wild stuff in this next launch. But... Yeah, the NASA and SpaceX collaboration here with this space station is going to be a huge thing. And the funny thing is, NASA is a government agency, and for forever, they've been using taxpayers' money to do things like this, experiments like this. And Phil McAllister, the director of commercial space flight at NASA, said, It is great to see companies invest their own capital toward innovative commercial space capabilities. We've seen how these types of partnerships benefit both the private sector and NASA. So basically they're saying, hey, all of you companies out here, Blue Origin, Northrop Grumman, Sierra Space, SpaceX, Special Aerospace Services, Think Orbital and Fast Space, 
you spend your money, you figure this out, and then we're going to partner with you to use your technology in the future. And we're going to pay for it, but you have to figure it out. Like you're going to have to have a minimum viable product, the MVP, so we can use it for our own services for the future, whether that's a space station with SpaceX, or if they're going to be using it, of course, for HLS and further missions, but it's different than what it used to be for the longest time. It's uh, very different. Absolutely. And it's really is a great solution. NASA puts so much money and effort into developing things like the SLS and everything that came before it, space shuttle and whatnot. To have commercial companies do all that research development and testing, and then to just pay them a bunch of money at the end or during it as a sort of seed money, it's just so much easier for everybody as far as the government is concerned and a lot less risk as well. Yeah. And then you hand off that risk to private companies. Absolutely. It, it leaves so much more, so much more room for NASA to play around with different ideas too. They don't have to stick with one thing like the SLS. They're stuck with the SLS. They can't yeah. really diverge from that and say, oh, we're going to stop doing that because Starship works now. They have a contract. They're going to be building these SLS rockets for the foreseeable future. And what Starship surpasses the SLS in technology and weight to orbit ratio, to, weight ratio to orbit, but they don't care because they have these contracts in place with Boeing and other companies, Northrop Grumman, et cetera, to build these SLS rockets Yeah, and they can't change it. You know, what I really like about the con this commercial partnerships is that some, someone like SpaceX is going to pay for their materials, what they should be paying as opposed to what NASA pays for materials, a screw NASA's paying for a screw might cost them a hundred dollars a screw because the companies that are selling them that screw know that they can get away with it. Whereas SpaceX is saying, we're not paying that we'll build a machine and make these for a dime a piece. If that's what you're going to bother charging us, it's a much more efficient from an economic standpoint to have the commercial partners take care of all the stuff because they're not going to get overcharged the way NASA has traditionally been overcharged. Yeah. I think that's an important step forward for NASA and an important step forward for these companies, because not only do they get money for these initial projects, but they can add things onto it eventually. So SpaceX could say, okay, we have the starship. We have a crew starship, but we can also make a space station starship. Would you be interested in the space station? NASA could be like, yeah, we like that idea. That's a great idea. We're going to give you the money for it, even if it's just a concept right now. But since SpaceX brought it to them in a capability, you know, in the capacity of a, like a commercial project, then they're going to pay, like SpaceX is going to pay for it. And then NASA yep. will pay them whatever SpaceX wants to charge them. So for sure, I think it's going to be a, a huge boost to the low earth orbit economy, but also the economy of deep space exploration as well. Yeah. And keep in mind as well, that SpaceX has never had any interest in space stations, low yeah. earth orbit beyond Starlink. So this, that would be a change of tune and it would have to come with a, obviously a big check behind it for them to do something like that. Or they see some benefit in having a station in orbit and they're willing to work with NASA to get one. Does, is it a good starting off point for a, a mission to Mars or something like that to have all the tankers take all their fuel there and then you dock a ship there and launch it from there? They'd have to determine whether that makes sense or not. Yeah. But I guess the tankers in space will eventually resemble or serve the same purpose as that space station, right? Just having a ship in space that's gets refueled to refuel another space ship. That's a space station right there. <laughs> yeah. Very yeah. basic one. Yeah. But minus it, the people. Yeah. But yeah, I also think that if SpaceX does make some sort of space station out of the Starship, they can charge rent to NASA and that could be recurring mm -hmm. income for SpaceX. If they can see the ROI on a Starship that's in orbit and they can make X amount of dollars per year from it to continue development of better starships, Mars starships, ground systems, infrastructure, whatever. If it's going to pay for part of the development of these new systems or even Starlink, then that might be something they would be interested in because it seems, I wouldn't say free money because they still have to have people 
manning the systems and fixing up the ships and stuff as time goes by. But once the, once the ships are decommissioned, they could in theory outfit the ships with, I don't know, like I wouldn't, I don't want to say plug and play, but it could be a very compartmentalized systems that they could take out of one starship and put into a newer starship. And it could be really easy to transfer those things because the docking mechanisms for the HLS starship, it's pretty big. If you think about not the docking, the, the elevator systems are, is pretty big. So maybe that could be as part of the docking system. It could be big enough that they could transfer A, people, and B, supplies from one starship to another. So decommission one, take it back down to Earth, refurb it, do whatever you got to do, and then upgrade your starship to a new one. And it seems like you could have a, you could have a space station forever in that case. For sure. The beauty of Starship has from day one has been its cost effectiveness. It's extremely, relatively, extremely cheap to make. And to, they could put up another one on a moment's notice at some point, right? To replace a part that, a, a ship that is malfunctioning, can bring it back down, whatnot. As you say before, there's a lot of other companies that are involved in this partnership with NASA. So it's uh, SpaceX is just one part of that. There's all kinds of ship of companies that would be doing similar things with them and for them. Yeah. Blue Origin, the project that Blue Origin is going to be used for with this NASA collaboration is integrated commercial space transportation capability that ensures safe, affordable, and high frequency U.S. access to orbit for crew and other missions. That just, does that mean that they're going to be using a rocket to get to lower orbit? The commercial it space transportation? Like Blue Origin is the taxi. It sounds me, like it. Yeah. Or at least one of the taxis. Yeah. For sure. And nothing, it really says nothing else. It says other missions, whatever that means, but it doesn't really give them anything else. There's no other part or piece of this future NASA, the space that they get out of this. You're ferrying people back and forth. Yeah. Sierra space it looks similarly too. Development. Well, Sierra's got, Sierra gets the in-space superstructure as well. They're actually primed for that next generation space station. So they get the space transportation, in-space infrastructure, and tailored space facilities to provide a human or a presence in orbit. They are really the space station, provided that they can meet all of their deadlines and whatnot. To be honest, at that point, SpaceX seems like they're in the wings in case Sierra can't provide what they need. And they could work together. This is a collaborative effort Absolutely. with NASA. So any one of these everything companies. that goes up in space needs to work with together. Yeah. Universal locks and universal this and universal that. You can't have anything that is proprietary when you're, when you talk about NASA and space, it's all got to work together. Yeah. The, so one that's very interesting is vast. And this is some cool wording, collaborating with NASA on technologies and operations required for its microgravity and artificial gravity stations it includes the Haven one which will provide a microgravity environment for crew research and in-space manufacturing. And the first crewed mission called VAST-1 to the platform. Development activities for larger space station modules will also take place under the Space Act Agreement. So artificial gravity stations, pretty sci-fi, if you ask me. That's very sci-fi. That's your yeah. rotating stations for sure. Yeah, and that'll take, uh, would be that'll pretty take years. Cool. Yeah, it'll be cool. They're going to have to, I think what they'll do is they'll set up a smaller version of they're gonna have to incrementally send up smaller medium large etc anti-gravity artificial not anti but artificial gravity stations <laughs> <laughs> anti-gravity would be wild but artificial yeah. gravity stations oh, yeah. proof of concept is was one of the first things right you got to yeah. get up there and prove that it's going to work and it's going to be able to be stable and and what do people how do people react in that situation, we don't actually know. I we can guess based on experience that we've done on Earth about spinning people around in a circle, but how long term effects of somebody being spun and just observing around them, right? This part of the station is spinning slower than that part of the station and it's all curved. And how does that affect somebody? Yeah. Be curious to see. Yeah. And they're going to be, oh, go ahead. Go, no, go, please. Oh, I believe they're going to be using Starship as a transportation system for the Vast One as well, or the Haven One. So To get it up there? Yeah. Nice. They're going to be using, I believe, the Falcon 9. Yeah. So they're going to be doing the Haven One on the Falcon 9, and then they're going to be using the Starship eventually too. So 
it's pretty cool. They're all going to be collaborating with each other and also NASA. So it's going to be, it's going to, that's going to happen in 2025. So yeah, August, 2025, apparently that's going to be pretty soon. Yeah. A couple of years from now. Yeah. And the other ones we haven't talked about are the ones that kind of interest me quite a bit. Northrop Grumman and space aerospace services, special aerospace, aerospace services and think orbital are all on the robotic side of things. That's getting things up there to build stations and to manufacture things and not put people in danger of getting lost in space or being subject to being out in space with the radiation and whatnot. So it's, I'd like that side of it as well. Curious to see how that develops. So this, the Northrop Grumman, the persistent platform to provide autonomous and robotic capabilities for commercial science research and manufacturing capabilities in low Earth orbit. The manufacturing capabilities part of that is pretty cool. I'm interested to see what they do, if they're going to mm -hmm. 3D print things or if they're going to be doing, just take parts from Earth, like just say beams and trusses and pieces and then put them together robotically. I don't know what the actual mission is. They don't have any more information about it, but it seems like that would be something that they could do up there as many manufacture parts of a station or parts of something with robots. Yeah. That's the dream we always see, right? We always see in the future, the sci-fi things are being built right in space. You've got your sort of space dock where the ship is being built in place up in space around in earth's orbit. And that would be cool to see something I was, when I was a kid, I was really fascinated by space welding where you put two pieces of steel together that are perfectly flat and as soon as they go together, there's nothing stopping them from joining. So it's a weld that just happens because they're, the molecules just pass from one piece of metal to the other. Oh, wow. Because there's nothing stopping them. There's no, there's no oxygen. There's nothing in the way. These the molecules just passing from one piece to the next and it joins. Pretty cool. I might have that wrong. It's been a long time since I looked into that, but, but that was one thing when I was a kid. It was really cool. That would be wild. That would open up so many, so many doors to stations and architecture in space. That's mm. cool. That's really cool. I never, I didn't even know about that space welding. I'll have to look into that. That's cool. I'm going to look it up again too. I could be totally wrong. Be completely ridiculed, but that's okay. <laughs> leave it, kid. leave it in the comments, people. <laughs> <laughs> leave it <in> the comments. <laughs> yeah. I think we've touched on everything here. Is there any, are there any other companies you'd like to talk about? I know we talked about Sierra space, but you didn't get to talk about special aerospace services much. They all do the same kind of thing. Special aerospace services is ta is looking at autonomous maneuvering units, astronaut assistance units. So it's all servicing the station outside, helping astronauts as well as perhaps doing autonomous work as well to keep things running, keep it serviced. If somebody drops a hammer, if this thing can go and get it rather than the astronaut having to risk something or it being one more piece of space junk, maybe they're out there collecting that stuff as well. Hmm. That would be really cool to see. That would be cool. Uh, yeah. And then think orbital, similar to just another piece of a space station, but they do the orbital platforms and research manufacturing, astronaut missions, that sort of thing. So it's building stuff in space, building more things on there. So there's the, the autonomous builders, if you will. This that was really cool to see. And it'll be interesting to see how these all work together as well. Can they, can Blue Origin and SpaceX sit down in the same room and figure out the best way to move humanity forward? Wouldn't that be nice? That would be really cool. I think all of these companies working together, building platforms and building stations and sending things, they're going to be working together in buying trips to space from different companies, Blue Origin or through SpaceX or through Sierra Space, if they need to send something up there, they're going to be working together to send part of their sent part of their space station or part of part of their platforms up there. So it'll be an interesting time for all of these companies to work together and to also to work with NASA. And they're going to be using NASA's technology. They're going to be using NASA's capabilities to innovate in space and all of the stuff that NASA has learned throughout their time with the International Space Station and through their time with the Apollo programs and the space shuttle, all of that all of these companies can use that to better their platforms too. So it's going to be really cool. Very exciting. Yeah. I hope that the next 20 or 30 years are going to be very interesting in the yeah. space field and hopefully humanity's still around to take advantage of it. 
Yeah, I think we will be. I think there's, okay. we're not going to stop. I think this is going to be a really cool, interesting time. This is the stuff that I dreamed of when I was a kid. Like For sure. Like this, it's finally coming true that we're going to, people are going to start building their own space stations. Like companies are going to start building their own private space stations. Who knows? Eventually we'll be to the point where there's going to be a private mission to another star system like Prometheus or something like that show, the movie Prometheus, except maybe they won't be bringing DNA down to earth and dumping it into a river. Be a little bit different, <laughs> but it's going to, it's going to be wild in the next 20, 30 years. What happens up there? Because not only is it SpaceX, it's all these other companies that want to make money and they get, they make billions of dollars per year from NASA and also from each other. So it's going to be cool. Can't wait to see it happen. Yeah. Same here. Thanks, Neil. Thank you very much for having me on here, Will. Yeah, of course. Anytime. All right. That's it, everybody. Take care of yourselves and each other, and I will see you in the next one.